Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. This is so great. I have to interrupt people talking to each other. I'm so thrilled. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, those of you who are here in person for, uh, for coming in this morning. Um, really appreciate that. Thank you all um, of you who are on Zoom as well. Um, and we hope going forward, we will find ways to make it easier uh, for you to be here in person as well. I have to say just uh, bumping into people I haven't seen um, some of them for three years, it's really a thrill. Uh, just to have um, that momentary interaction. Um, so um, uh, speaking of momentary interactions, uh, this afternoon, three o'clock, uh, the um, department um, uh, holiday party, woohoo, yes, um, which will uh, just be over at the ramp, great place, um, wonderful setting. Uh, and it, I think it runs from three to six or three hours. Um, uh, please uh, come by. Uh, so far, we have 400 RSVPs, uh, so it'll really be an oppor um, opportunity to uh, to get a chance to see people that you might not have seen in a long time, and um, so looking forward to that as well. So um, we have a short period of time, and, and I don't want to take any away from our... Um, I want to remind, this is, you know, of course, very, very simplistic uh, a view, and I want to remind people, there's this wonderful review out of Takeo Hench's group, that critical period regulation, plasticity uh, regulation is occurring across multiple timescales. And that's just a reminder to us that these timescales can be over, really are, are occurring over milliseconds as inputs are coming in, perhaps very salient, uh, your learning events in the environment that's causing uh, changes in circuit functioning on the Orient order of milliseconds. Of course, learning is being consolidated or these plasticity processes are, are sort of, again, being consolidated over a period of days. Sleep plays an important role there. And then we have these sort of longer over the course of the lifetime, over the course of generations, uh, the fact that um, as we have uh, uh, modifications, transcriptional modifications, chromatone modifications, uh, methylation modifications, that experience, the experience that an organism is having over the course of its lifetime is resulting in epigenetic changes that in fact can be, uh, can result in, in, in changes in plasticity capacity in the offspring, which is a very sobering thought, right? When we think about uh, cumulative effects of adversity of trauma, intergenerational trauma, and how it may actually be changing the, the learning capacities of, of, the, of the future generations, very sobering in terms of social justice issues. So I'm gonna um, hit upon three themes and their treatment implications, as well as some of the work that we've done kind of connected to these themes. Um, the first is, is this idea that maladaptive plasticity processes, which are relevant to psychosis, are emerging from activity decorrelation, activity depatterning, if you will, within I'm putting it in parentheses, prefrontal neuronal ensembles. And I'm putting it in parentheses because ultimately it is this, this pattern disruption in prefrontal neuronal ensembles, which is giving rise to the, the impairments, the symptoms, the deficits we see in these illnesses. But what, as I will show you, and as other research has shown, basic science research has shown, some of this decorrelation can happen uh, lower down in the information processing hierarchy, if you will, and then feed forward and have its effects on what's happening in prefrontal cortex. Uh, second theme is that adolescence is this critical period for developing social competence, um, and, and it's a high period of circuit vulnerability. Um, and then finally, that this notion, as I said from this first review by, uh, by uh, Takeo's group, that dysregulated plasticity processes are interacting across levels of scale and time. Again, these are enormous concepts. They're broad concepts. They can mean everything and nothing. Um, and I'm going to just drill down into a few of them, which I think have sort of, again, interesting implications as we think about treatments for psychosis, and I would argue uh, relevant for uh, other psychiatric illnesses as well. All psychiatric illnesses are developmental illnesses, and all of them involve uh, a disruption or an aberrant pattern, patterning in how the brain is processing or learning or representing information and then the kind of action outputs which are being chosen. So let's talk about uh, this first theme. And uh, I want to make two points here, and, and this is kind of my favorite theme because it's, the, it's what we've taken for our, our P50 Conti Center uh, work. 
and, uh, and, and we've added sort of some, so we've layered on in that particular work, some computational modeling of, of these principles. But, but the first point I want to make is that this decorrelation or this abnormal patterning um, uh, that, that, that occurs in these, in these prefrontal cortical ensembles, um, it it's, can arise from intrinsic dysfunction in that machinery. That's, a, that's how I, I would say the majority of the ideas about where is the genesis of psychosis is emerging from. It's that there are primary dysfunction in, in prefrontal local circuits. And what do I mean by that? an MDA receptor dysfunction. I think any of you who, who work with, with psychosis or do research know that that's kind of a, a, a concept that's been around for a long time. Uh, Parvalmumin interneuron dysfunction, that's another concept. So, so there are ideas and there's even again, sort of you know, evidence, smoking gun evidence, uh, direct evidence that these can be the origins of the dysfunction and how these, uh, and why these microcircuits, these local circuits are not, uh, representing information very well, right? That's what they need to do. The brain has to represent information in the world, operate on it, compare it to previous information, make statistical inferences about it so that we can respond adaptively to our environment. Um, so there's there's a lot of evidence around that. I'll, I'll, I'll just show you one, which I happen to like because it comes from Minnesota, uh, from my colleagues. Um, but the point, the second point I want to make is that this this activity decorrelation, this this unwiring or this ma this maladaptive patterning in terms of these microcircuits and how they're representing information, can also arise when there are statistically noisy or degraded inputs into that machinery. So this first point, um, and I'm going to show you this this uh, very briefly, which is a, a wonderful recent paper by Matt and, and Jenny Zick, who's an MD PhD resident now in our program. And what they did is they looked at two different, um, if you will, uh, potentially causal factors relevant to, to psychosis spectrum illnesses, uh, one in a non-human primate. It was a bl blockade of NMDA receptors, a drug-induced blockade, and the other was in a mouse model relevant to, to, to schizophrenia. And what they did is they took these two animal models and then they looked at essentially uh, spike synchrony in prefrontal neurons. So, so are these neurons uh, working synchronously or not? And, and, and they wanted to see these two different kinds of insults that are relevant to the expression of, of psychosis in humans. Do, are they converging in any way on what's happening in prefrontal cortex, cortex? And they saw that, yes, indeed, there's this convergence on prefrontal local circuits. And what they saw is that there's impairments and spike synchrony, again, the timing, uh, the synchronous timing of, 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 of cells in these circuits, and also weaker synaptic connections. And there, there were these parallel changes that are happening. And they then sort of hypothesized that what you're having is, is a plasticity or spike timing dependent dysplasticity because neurons that aren't firing well together aren't gonna to wire well together. Um, and that's dis disconnecting prefrontal circuits. And that's an idea that is very sort of, I, I would say, um, well accepted in, in some of the models as we think about what may give rise to psychosis symptoms. So we're not going to belabor this. This is just a, a you know a couple of images from their paper that I like, and this is uh, they measured. They looked at synchronous spiking. This is in the monkey model, where, and this is in, in blue is where they give the drug that blocks an MD, NMDA receptors. Uh, this is in the mouse model, which is a DGCR8 model, and again this is the genetic model. And what they see is that this cross correlation in terms of how neurons are are firing together is decreased. Uh, here again, you can see they looked at the coupling. Um, they looked here at a measure of what they call effective communication or, or a transfer entropy. Uh, and again, you can see that it's a decreased in these two diff very different uh, models that are sort of two different sort of origins. And so what they hypothesize is that the runaway prefrontal cortical disconnect disconnection, uh, which many of us feel is a, is a uh, kind of a, a good kind of pathophysiologic uh, uh, basis, right, for explaining what we see in, in psychosis, can occur from different insults that are converging on the way local circuits are functioning. So you could have an MDA receptor blockade or, or this uh, genetic uh, deletion, and that affects synchronous uh, PFC spiking. You can have excessive synaptic pruning, another uh, hypothesized uh, causal factor in schizophrenia. You can have developmental underconnectivity of this circuitry due to in utero insults or early childhood insults, insults, and that's going to affect the recurrent PFC connections. 
And these, you know, these processes feed on each other and you can have either have the virtuous cycle when, when the brain is in a healthy state of development, or you can have this vicious cycle and you can get this, this um, kind of, again, this, this feedback of synchrony deficits and connectivity deficits. And if they're going in the wrong direction, you get this disconnectivity. But there's another set of processes that can contribute to this PFC uh, dysfunction and, and, and decorrelation of, of neuronal ensembles um, and, and these dysplasticity mechanisms. And that is um, the, the nature of the inputs uh, into the machinery. And this is work um, by Etienne de Vieille-Sidani, who's at the uh, Montreal Neurological Institute uh, with a, a, a postdoc who'd been working with him, Brishna Kamal. And what they did, and this is again, very interesting to me, is they took young adult rats and they exposed them to eight weeks of low grade broadband noise. So this is statistically um, decorrelated. It's, it's, it's information coming to the brain in a way that isn't patterned. Uh, it's kind of in a sense overwhelming the brain's representational systems. And what they saw is reduced neural synchrony, degraded frequency tuning maps, and changes that are similar to, to the, the uh, cortical mapping degradation one sees over time in aging rats. And um, now this was in primary auditory cortex, um, and, and uh, they have other evidence, I, I won't show you images from it, that that was also showing up then in prefrontal cortex because this noisy or degraded information is being fed forward. Um, and, is, and is changing the way prefrontal cortex can represent information. But I wanted to show you these images because again, you have the healthy rat, you have the noise exposed rat, you have the aged rat. This again is, is, a, is a correlation coefficient in terms of the spiking synchrony. And you can see again, that it's decreased similar to uh, what Matt and, and Jenny have been shown. These are um, the actual maps in primary auditory cortex of frequency tuning. You can see what a young, healthy rat should look like. Each of these spots are representing a group of neurons that are representing certain frequencies. That's very important information if you're a rat. And you can see how that, that uh, frequency tuning mapping gets degraded in the noise-exposed rat, similar to what's in the aged rat. So in other words, you can, you can drive a cortex into, into a dysplastic state depending on what are the environmental inputs? And I think that's really important to remember. I think again, for anyone who thinks developmentally uh, about the different kinds of inputs uh, and insults that a, that a developing brain uh, gets, uh, gets exposed to, that this is actually can be driving these changes in how uh, local circuits are operating and how the brain is mapping information. Um, and the other kind of piece I wanted to show you here, because it's again relevant to things we think about in schizophrenia, is they also did a, um, they also recorded uh, the oddball response in, in, um, uh, in auditory and in, in prefrontal cortex in these rats, which is the response to, is the, is the cortex picking up the fact in a train of sounds, and we have we have world experts in, in, uh, audible, uh, in audible, audible, audible tasks here in, in, in uh, human, humans with schizophrenia, but here's the rat. And, and so the oddball task is, you know, if there's a train of sounds um, that are you know, very common and frequent, and then you have an oddball sound that comes in, the cortex should register it. The, cor the cortex should be able to map that and say, aha, this is a different kind of signal coming in and, and I represent it differently. And, and this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing the, the standards, we're seeing the oddball, and you can see that there's, in a sense, the cortex can represent these or map these out and, and, and distinguish among them. But in the noise exposed rats, the cortex is losing that ability. The, the salient oddball is now kind of being muddled or mushed up closer in terms of how the cortex is representing it uh, to the standard. And that's similar to what we see in the aged rat. Um, and this is just, again, showing how these uh, physiologic changes are also being ref reflected in, in action actual changes in, in, in structure um, of, of, of these, of this, again, these small regions of the brain. And what we're seeing is a decrease in parvalbumin, GABA mapping, uh, GABA um, uh, uh, mapping and parvalbumin uh, positive um, interneurons, again, noise exposed, aged, and in decreased myelin basic protein, right? So these are, these are the, the molecules that are actually forming the substrate of these circuits. So this is this first theme. Again, I've just shown you two highlights of, of it. But so the question then comes up, is there some way to restore, you know, to bring these neuronal ensembles, which are unwiring, which are getting discoordinated, which are showing this abnormal patterning, is there some way to, to get them tuned or back, back uh, with better synchronous spiking, with better, uh, better fidelity of how they're representing the information? Um, uh, and how would you do that? And, and could there be relevance to, to some of what we could do with psychosis? So um, 
this paper, again by Etienne when he was a postdoc working with Mike here at UCSF, Mike Mersnick, um, this, this is exactly what they did. What they did is they took um, older rats who show some of this degradation that I was just describing to you in terms of the mapping of auditory information, in terms of the oddball, auditory oddball response, and they trained the rats on a frequency discrimination task um, over and over and over again, uh, the aged rat. And what they saw is that by training the aged rat brain uh, to get better and better at frequency discrimination, which rats do lose as they get older, they were able to sort of, in a sense, reverse some of these cortical changes that they saw in the aged rat. And, 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 and the cortex began to look more like a younger rat. Uh, and also its physiologic responses did as well. So uh, here's the, a young rat in terms of auditory oddball response. Here's a young trained rat. Um, here's what the aged rat looks before training. Here's, here's what the aged rat looks like after training. So again, you can see that the cortex has regained its capacity to uh, kind of differentially map or represent the oddball versus the standard. Um, and again, they just looked at some of these mapping, um, uh, frequency tuning maps and tonotopic maps. And again, this is the aged rat. This is the aged trained rat compared to the young rat. Uh, and they looked here at, at parval parvalbumin um, interneuron, interneuron staining, again, young, aged, and the, and the trained aged rat here. So we actually reviewed, um, there's many other papers uh, that Etienne has done um, examining some of these same processes, you know, pushing the, uh, the brain into a dysplastic state, bringing it back uh, into more sort of, you know, youthful, healthy looking plasticity uh, in terms of some of these cortical measures. And here again, I don't want to sort of, you know, belabor any specific points, but I just want to show some of the findings from the uh, from the work done in rodents um, that are seen, for example, in either aged rats or these rats exposed to broadband noise. Um, and then parallel findings, similar analogous findings, not, not exactly perfectly matched up, but analogous findings that we see in psychosis spectrum illness. Um, and then in the animal model, the degree to which some of these abnormalities can be reversed um, when we do this um, kind of, um, I would say, more uh, perceptually based uh, uh, training that is focused on cleaning up the mapping or cleaning up the degraded input um, into cortex. And you can see that uh, there are some of these um, aspects which are actually um, uh, reversed uh, quite reasonably well. So let's review. This is a cartoon, again, highly simplified, but I think I, I have found it useful to think about what are these plasticity operations? How are they interacting with each other during healthy brain development, or even ideally during something which is super, um, what would you call it, super therapeutic for the brain, perhaps? Let's talk about early music training. You know, in, in something like early music training or healthy devel development, the activity inputs are are um, kind of highly selective. They're um, they're uh, they're repeated frequently. They're they're meaningful. Uh, they're they're often got good statistical patterning to them. So you know, someone's learning how to listen to notes. Uh, represent that information. Those notes are coming in, um, uh, you know, to the to the brain, to the cortex. And as that information is coming in, of course, it's it's affecting local microcircuit functions because you know microcircuits are are adjusting to represent, for example, that beautiful those that beautiful sequence of notes with higher fidelity. This is generating the plasticity effects in the brain, which is, you know, change, you know, the, the, uh, you know, this better wiring, if you will, the tighter wiring, the tighter linking together of these neuronal ensembles representing the information with changes in gray matter, changes in white matter, uh, downstream, right, sort of these more systems-based changes. And that, in turn, changes the brain's representational capacity. So a trained musician represents you know, auditory and musical information coming in in a way that's very different, higher fidelity, higher reliability, precision speed than, for example, my brain does. And of course, the better the brain is at representing information, certain kinds of information coming from the world, the cleaner are the activity inputs or the more relevant, the sharper, uh, the more germane are the, are the inputs then that sort of go. So again, you have this virtuous cycle. Um, so again, just to sort of review, again, in the healthy condition or the, the adaptive condition, here are the quality of the inputs. 
Here's how it's affecting the microcircuit functioning. Uh, I think what's particularly important is that you get this increase in the spike timing synchrony, the coordinated patterning among excitatory neurons, and increased inhibitory tone in the parvalgum and interneurons, which is what keeps the, allows the circuits to mature, keeps the, the tuning uh, uh, precise, maturation of these local circuits, and the tuning of the fidelity and power of, of these ensembles. And of course, then we get um, this adaptive synaptic pruning, circuits that aren't needed or connections that aren't needed are pruned away. We get consolidation of this activity patterning and we get these downstream effects, as I mentioned. And then we create stable attractor networks in the brain. These are the, the larger groupings of, of neurons that can represent information, um, again, with sort of high reliability adaptively high fidelity um, can represent then uh, and act upon salient information and, and, and the brain can then engage in appropriate action selection and output. But what about in the individual who might be very vulnerable to psychosis or prone to psychosis? Again, we have now this vicious cycle um, uh, in, in which all components of, of, of these, this cascade are, are being interrupted. So we have abnormal activity inputs. We have disrupted local microcircuit function. We have these dysplasticity effects. We have these aberrant representational processes. So let me just give you some examples. We have dopamine dysregulation. We, it's unclear now in the field, is that primary or is that secondary to the cortical dysfunction? There's arguments to be made uh, in both directions. Um, but that creates a, a brain which is experiencing stochastic salience um, in the world, unpredictable inputs. We have decreased functioning that's starting to happen, um, and, and, and that causes social and cognitive deferentiation. The person's withdrawing. They're staying in their room. They're not going to school. They're not, not reading anymore. We have, we know that chronic and acute stress and trauma contribute to the risk and vulnerability for psychosis. Well, we know that those being exposed to, to trauma creates affective dysregulation, cognitive dysregulation that can alter perception and increase, you know, uh, uh, you know increase sort of, a, you know, arousal into pathological sort of uh, uh, levels. There's inflammatory processes, again, whether they're primary or secondary uh, is not quite known. THC use, these two can further degrade the way the, the nervous system represents and, and moves information uh, uh, forward up the hierarchy. I want to just, I, I, I mentioned, you know, the part about the dopamine dysregulation. The interesting thing about it, of course, is that all of our treatments so far are just focused on this one component, right? It's, it's we try to bring the dopamine, uh, you know, back. We sort of block block the D2 receptors, and and we we see that okay, that can reduce the psychotic symptoms. But as any of you who work with patients, you know that blocking those the psychotic symptoms by itself is not enough to uh, restore functioning, right? You reduce symptoms, but people are still uh, impaired functionally. Um, so what's the, the, the downstream effects? We get this dysregulated neuronal patterning. Uh, we get a reduced signal to noise ratio um, in the circuitry. We have a decrease in the inhibitory tone. Uh, we have a delay or aberrancies in how the, the circuits are maturing. And again, just these neuronal ensembles, so decreased fidelity, speed, power, coordination. Uh, and, and we see this um, uh, evidence for maladaptive synaptic pruning, dysregulation of microglial activity. We don't get these high fidelity patterns. We get loss of myelin, loss of gray matter. Um, and then finally, in terms of then, okay, there's this, this disruption in how the brain can now represent information. We get, we, we again, we, these are inferred, but these are inferred from, from, from a range of different uh, evidence. Uh, forms of evidence, which is that the attractor networks or the way, again, the brain is representing information is abnormal, it's discoordinated. We have these un unstable and unreliable brain representational processes um, that then result in impairment in cognition and, 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 and these abnormal states in which the brain is, is again, if you, as we say, clinically losing touch with reality or not able to respond appropriately to reality. So, here, let's come back to this, this question now, how in humans could we start to try to restore some of this, this coordinated neuronal activity with the idea that we're going to improve some of these degraded um, perceptual and attentional processes um, and, and, and hopefully have an effect, you know, again, we're hypothesizing have an effect on the different parts of this, of this uh, uh, cascade. 
So, um, you know, here, it, I would say that as people are thinking about novel treatments for, for schizophrenia, uh, I would say a lot of the work has been focused on the local microcircuits. Is there something we can think about or learn more about NMDA receptor functioning, about parvalbumin interneuron functioning? You know, I've talked about the dopamine uh, blockade in terms of, you know, re-regulating uh, striatal dopamine. Um, but what I'm going to talk about in our work uh, highlighting is that really our work, again, based on the, the, the collaboration with Mike Mersnick that I've had over a number of years in this Mersnickian idea that if we can target these degraded inputs, then we might have, we might drive some improvements throughout this, this cycle. The idea being that we might reverse some dysplasticity effects or, or prevent them from occurring um, and improve representational processes. So um, we recently uh, reported on the uh, six month, um, uh, on kind of a complete data set, which included, um, uh, which, in which we um, uh, kind of performed or, or offered um, intensive auditory perceptual cognitive training via laptops remotely to individuals who were in, in their first five years of psychosis. Um, we did that. Um, it was a randomized controlled trial. All the assessments were done by people who are blind to group condition. There was an active uh, auditory training group. There was a computer games control group. Uh, people did about 20 to 40 hours of training over an eight to 10 week period. Um, and uh, here's our overall study design. Immediately after the intervention, we had assessments, but we brought people back six months later and redid the assessments. This was a two site study with our colleagues at Davis. Um, and uh, this was in the university clinic. So these were higher functioning uh, uh, young individuals. We paid people for participation. And um, I can tell you now from having tried to I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, it's, it's very different. First of all, it was different doing this study when we first started about eight years ago, because it was kind of, you know, fun and cool to have a laptop and, 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 and do this on the laptop. Now, of course, that's old hat. And secondly, we paid people for participation. And, and this is very intensive. It's very effortful. It's like, it's like training. It's like, having to go to a gym every day. So it's not something that is uh, entertaining or game-like uh, in any, by any means. I'm gonna jump right to the punchline, um, which is that uh, as we uh, looked at the six month data, we saw significant group by time interactions in a global cognition summary score, which was our main outcome of interest because our hypothesis was that as we would clean up the auditory, the degraded sort of improve aud degraded auditory perceptual representations through this auditory training, we would um, have this sort of uh, feed forward improvement and how prefrontal cortex could operate upon represent uh, information. And that should push uh, overall cognitive functioning in the right direction. Um, and this is the summary score that includes things like, you know, verbal memory, speed of processing, working memory and attention. But within this global cognition, we saw specifically improvements in problem solving, a, a, a Tower of London a measure, and in speed of processing. Speed of processing, I would say, is not so surprising because the exercises are speeded. They, they again, you know, drive the auditory cortex to be able to respond more, more quickly and accurately at speed, at threshold. Um, but problem solving, there was nothing about the training that trained the ability to kind of plan and, and, and solve a problem. So that sort of was interesting to us. And then what we also saw at six months was um, a significant um, improvement in positive symptom ratings. So positive symptom ratings uh, went down, went down in both groups. Both groups were involved in first episode clinics, uh, but you can see here the, the, the differential that we see in the group that got exposed to the cognitive training. Why would that be? Why would this have some effect on positive symptoms? It's all hypothetical at this point based on that, that figure that I just showed you, but that the fact that we observed this was, was highly interesting to us. A few comments on some of these specific findings. We have seen in several samples that this increase in global cognition is mediated by the improvement in auditory psychophysical processing efficiency, maybe kind of similar to what Etienne showed in the rats, you know? get that auditory mapping better and other things in the brain seem to work better too. Um, again, likely because of these pro-plasticity kind of component. This is work done by Bruno Bajanti, uh, who was a postdoc at the time. Um, and then in terms of this problem solving in a different sample of participants, a, a sample that was not just only first episode, um, we had done some MEG uh, recordings. And uh, what we showed is that um, 
it was the plasticity in the auditory cortex that seemed to be driving or, or certainly significantly associated with the improvement in the problem solving capacity. So that's that kind of question I was asking, why would this kind of perceptual training allow the brain to be better at problem solving? Um, and this particular set of studies was done with a Sri Nagarajan here in the Department of Radiology, Corby Dale, uh, who was a research scientist in that lab. And I'm going to just spend a few minutes and unpack it because um, I do think this has implications for, again, some of these hypothesized relationships I've been talking about to you in this cascade. So this was a magneto magnetoencephalography. Um, and um, uh, here's a little bit about the methods. Um, these are methods out of Shree's lab. And the idea is that essentially this is a very sophisticated way in that we can represent, um, uh, in a sense, what is, what is electrical um, patterning or activity happening in the brain. And we can uh, represent it with high precision in terms of timing and in terms of localization. Um, and again, sort of just moving to the punchline, we looked at first M100 activity, which is that uh, early response in primary auditory cortex in the human brain. Here's your active training or your auditory training patients. Here's the computer games patients. Session one just means before training. Session two just means after training. Um, and uh, what you can see is after training in the group that gets the auditory training, we see an increase in the M100 activity. This is a broadband response. Healthy con comparison subjects are just to show what healthies do at two different sessions. They did not get any training. This is just sort of your comparison to, to the healthy population. Um, and here's the right auditory cortex. So what you can see is in the group that gets this perceptual training, the uh, auditory information is being represented with, with higher power, if you will, um, in auditory cortex. We also looked at high gamma activity. Um, uh, uh, this is the difference um, before training and after, uh, after training compared to before training. I'm just looking at the auditory training patients here. And what we see is um, some high gamma activation in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And I wanna focus on, on, on this one here very early in the, in the, in the trial. That means as the, uh, the auditory signal is coming on at zero, mil uh, zero milliseconds and very, very early immediately, even before the M100 response is being registered in auditory cortex, which is 100 milliseconds, prefrontal cortex has come online. So prefrontal cortex has sort of said, now, you know, in response, this is after training, I, this trial is happening, I know what to expect, I know auditory information is going to be coming in, I'm, I've got a preparatory response going on more efficient. Uh, again, this is sort of fits in with a large body of literature that, that this form of, of prediction, of predictive coding, of ability of the prefrontal cortex to, 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 to be able to attend to, um, and, 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 and uh, if you will, sort of shape, you know, or, or, or uh, kind, of, kind of scope out what's supposed to be happening next uh, is impaired in schizophrenia. But here we see some evidence that perhaps that is coming back online. And when we looked at this high gamma response um, in the active training participants, uh, here's left hemisphere, here's right hemisphere, we saw that it was positively correlated with the M100 response and auditory cortex, suggesting that there was a relationship with the, between the two improvements, uh, improvement in the fidelity of representation of auditory information in primary auditory cortex, improvement in the ability of the prefrontal cortex very, very early uh, in, you know, in a trial to, in a sense, come online, um, uh, be responsive. And it was this high gamma response in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that was correlating with the improvement in this Tower of London problem solving task. Um, again, suggesting these downstream effects, this choreography, uh, uh, this improvement in the choreography and of information flow. Um, so I just wanna hold, on, just have you hold on to that, that notion. Um, the fact that we saw this improvement in speed of processing, and not too surprising, although I'll say as this form of training has been done in aging humans, where we know speed of processing declines as people go into their older adult years, uh, it's been associated, it's what's been interesting is people exposed to this form of training um, have been shown to have fewer car accidents over the next five year period. Uh, so there are real world implications for, for uh, improving speed of processing. Um, oops, sorry. And then finally, as I, I've you know, said, why would this form of training result in reduced positive symptoms? Who knows? We're hypothesizing that again, it's this uh, increased, if you will, efficiency, um, this increased perhaps ability of, of prefrontal cortex to, to predictively uh, prepare for information in the world um, that may be, may be associated with this improvement in positive symptoms. 
in collaboration with, uh, with Dan Mathalon uh, and, and, and Judy Ford's lab, uh, and working very closely with Susanna Fryer, um, who has played a key role in these analyses, um, Ian Ramsey, um, who uh, was um, uh, a postdoc with me at University of Minnesota and then a faculty member. I have to say, sadly, he has left for industry, but he is working for Akili, which is the cognitive training um, uh, company that Adam Gazali here founded. So, you know, it's all, always a small family in a small world. Just did that left a few months ago, but he did um, some very nice analyses uh, in this collaboration with, uh, uh, with Dan uh, around some imaging um, in a subset of these participants, these young participants. Um, and so some of the things they looked at was uh, cortical thickness, um, and they looked at cortical thickness in, in uh, prefrontal cortex, in uh, temporal cortex. And what they saw is that um, a, a increase in this cortical thickness over the course of the, well, post-training compared to pre-training was associated with a positive uh, global cognition improvement. So those participants who showed the most improvement in global cognition were those people who showed this uh, cortical thickness change, and this was not seen in the computer games control group here in blue. They also looked at uh, thalamic volume and uh, also at thalamotemporal connectivity. And again, the same pattern keeps emerging, which is those participants who are showing this improvement in this global cognition, here it says change in neurocognition score, um, are those people who are showing the, the preservation or perhaps a, a, it's hard, I won't get into the details, it's hard to say whether it's an increase or whether it's a pre preservation of, of volume, thalamic volume uh, versus participants uh, who did not get the training and where there may be some against suggestion of, of dysplasticity processes occurring. Uh, same with the LAMO uh, temporal connectivity. And finally, this, this data is still unpublished. I think Ian was starting to work it up with, uh, with Susanna, um, but there's also training-induced changes in white matter diffusion, suggesting white matter changes uh, that are correlating with uh, this global cognition change score. Likely, it appears um, uh, consistent with the LAMO cortical cerebellar and temporal frontal tracts. So coming back to this, this idea of this cascade or this vulnerability in psychosis, and, and much of this is, is inferred or inferential or is based on what we know from some of the, you know, kind of knowing what happens in the animal models and sort of inferring, well, maybe something similar is happening in the humans. But this idea is that, you know, we, we offer this intensive training in order to clean up these degraded inputs, better in attentional control, the ability to hold the inputs in, in, uh, with higher fidelity and short scale working memory. There's indirect evidence that maybe again, these, these neural circuits, we can never look at the local, you know, truly look at the local microcircuits, but we're sort of inferring that we're, we're seeing better coordination and patterning, certainly at least along larger neuronal ensembles in, in early auditory cortex and in prefrontal cortex, the better choreography, um, if you will, uh, across these, these uh, nodes, uh, across the system. And then we see in, in terms of the dysplasticity effects, we do see this association uh, where we have um, uh, this you know, positive training response is, is associated with cortical thickness, thalamic volume, thalamic cortical connectivity, white matter integrity. And then we do see reduced positive symptoms. And I haven't shown you these data, but in a study with adult, the adults who've been ill a little bit longer, we see improvement in reality monitoring. Um, uh, and, and that also is at, seen six months later. So it does suggest, I would say the evidence is, is certainly suggestive that we can um, kind of come up with treatments that are, are working on, 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 on cleaning up the coordination of how the brain, different, you know, the ensembles in the brain and the systems in the brain are representing uh, uh, information, uh, that there are beneficial effects. But as I've mentioned to you, translation into clinical practice um, is difficult. We've been experimenting with it in different ways for a number of reasons, all of them behavioral, uh, not, not based on the science so much. Um, and so, you know, our feeling is that we're going to have to really speed up or accelerate um, uh, these effects effects by either adding proplasticity pharmacologic uh, augmentation in some way and or the addition of neuromodulation. And there are different groups uh, doing variations on these studies. Yeah. I'm noticing the time. So, I am. So let's see, what do I, what do I, what, what I want to leave you with? I want to, um, um, let's see. Oh gosh, there's so many pretty slides. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got to do this. I've got to do the second half of the talk. <laughs> I think I'm just going to stop here so we have some time for questions. <laughs>